Welcome to the Market Me podcast with your host, Mike Mall. Each episode of Market Me deconstructs real campaigns for actual businesses to improve their marketing efforts. Mike is the founder of Social Media House and a digital marketing consultant who teaches marketing strategy to executives and their teams from small business to Fortune 500 companies. Let's get started. And on today's episode, we're talking with Tony Minock of Selicor. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, thanks. Um, so in simplistic terms, we're a technology solutions company. And when you dive down into it, what we do is we work 100% in the automotive aftermarket, so specifically with auto parts. And what we do is we catalog that data into industry standards, and then we allow our customers to send that data out to their end clients. And then um, that's how we started out. And then we kind of morphed into an e-commerce company as well with the digital age and things moving digital. Better data sells better products, especially when it comes to auto parts because you're able to actually find the part that fits your vehicle. Consumers are becoming more and more comfortable ordering everything online. And with the accuracy of the data that we can get around making sure a part fits a car, consumers are becoming more comfortable ordering online. So the e-commerce side of our business has grown tremendously. Got it. And how, um, how did you get into it? It seems like a very niche, very specific space. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And everybody asks me that because it is, it is a very niche space. So I've always been a big believer of verticalization or specializing in a niche. And um, I was partners in a software company for many years. I exited that company and I had an old client um, that was looking, looking for basically a specialized piece of software. They were in the automotive industry. And they said, hey, we've got this problem. We think there's a problem in the entire industry. We can't find something that does this. Can you take a look at it? So we said, yeah, let's take a look at it. So I took a look at it. um, And then um, I went out to one of the bigger industry trade shows, just realized the market opportunity. And then from there, we just kind of developed the software um, ourselves. It's our own proprietary software. Um, and then we kind of morphed it into that, um, in, into just that. So we took one client to two clients, three clients to four clients and just scaled it like that. Love it. Love it. And so who, um, who are your buyers? Is it, it sounds like it's a combination of a couple of different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, our end clients are automotive or auto parts manufacturers in the aftermarket. And so what the aftermarket is, is you buy a car, you need a replacement part, things like that. Companies out there research what, what are called OEM parts, and then they kind of replicate those, or they improve those, or they make them performance-oriented, and they make they actually manufacture the parts. And within that segment of the industry, there's a couple other segments. So that's that was that is primarily one um, area of our end client. The other end client is, is the automotive industry is very much still a three-tier system, so there's wholesale distributors involved, and wholesale distributors are becoming um, more and more on our radar. A few years ago, they weren't on our radar. They just relied on other people to do the data for them and weren't as involved in e-commerce. And then the last segment that we go after are actual retailers. So online retailers, brick-and-mortar retailers, anybody that wants to get into the e-commerce game is our end client. So while we're very specialized in a niche, um, which is you know product data within the automotive aftermarket. Within that, we still have niches that we can niche down even more, and those are manufacturers, wholesale distributors, and retailers. Awesome. All right. And so from from the retailer side, that's more that's kind of a data purchase slash build out e commerce. I was on your website. It looks like you guys are partnered with Big Com. So do you build everything on Big Commerce? Yep. Yep. So from a data perspective, we're e-commerce agnostic. So we're an API first company. So our API can connect data to any e-commerce platform. So that side of our business, we don't really care what e-commerce platform we connect to. So our main solution, which is called Product Desk, because we're an API first company, we've built a connector to almost any e-commerce system, whether it be .NET Nuke, Magento, Shopify, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, you name it, we've done it, um, even some custom homegrown solutions. That allows us to in- integrate also to ERP systems such as SAP, um, Dynamics 365, and so forth, and NetSuite. Um, from an e-commerce perspective, yes, our preferred platform, when, when we act as, you know, quote-unquote, an agency, full turnkey agency to build a website, we do partner with BigCommerce the most. We've done a little bit with Shopify, and we like Shopify too. 
um, but AP, uh, the APIs with big commerce are a little bit more modern technology. They're a little bit more forward thinking in technology. So we partner pretty heavily with big commerce and it's been a, it's been a great partnership and we really love the team over there. Awesome. Yeah. I've actually been involved in a couple builds, um, on the big commerce side as well. So pretty, cool. Pretty, yeah. Pretty decent. So, um, so what's, what would you say is your kind of the biggest priority, not priority, but like where, what's your biggest line within those kind of three tiers? Where's the biggest kind of opportunity? Where was the biggest part of the business? Yeah. The biggest growth opportunity that we have is e-commerce because, you know, we feel that, um, we feel that every business, whether it be a local brick and mortar business or a virtual company or whatever should have e-commerce and be transacting somehow. So the day, our philosophy is the day and age of just having informational websites that people could find you out there are gone. You really need to transact, whether that's booking an appointment or ordering the part. People, um, you know, need to understand that. And the more that brick and mortar, um, a local business can understand that and can understand you know, true brand loyalty, which a lot of people have to local companies, they'll, they'll go order that online before they'll go order it other places if they know, like, and trust someone. So yeah. it's the same old adage, you know, as, like, like I said, know, like, and trust. It's the same way online. If someone knows you, whether they're, you know, giving you word of mouth referral or whatnot, that online transaction can happen. So the growth trajectory for us is on the online by taking more and more people in the automotive segment online and making parts available. Got it. And how, how do you think about the, the marketing and growth of that side of the business? Is it a lot of uh, hand-to-hand combat, door knocking? I mean, I'm sure you've got a lot of existing relationships. It sounds like mm-hmm. if you know, playing, in the, playing in that niche, you're, you're bound to make some friends and some, some people you yeah. can Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the, the, the automotive aftermarket, I, I forget what the latest statistic is, but I want to say it's like $26 billion <clears throat> annually. So that's a lot of companies. So there's just literally tens of thousands of companies that we can we can call on. So it's really um, you know you just your normal B two B marketing activities um, that kind of morph into that B two B type sale because we are in the B two B world. Um, it is a, it is transactional based, so it's not your traditional just sign up for an app and go. You know, we're, we're doing full turnkey e-commerce sites. So we're doing design, development, look, feel, product flow, order management, things like that. So it's, it's a traditional um, uh, a B2B um, sales process. So our sales cycles sometimes are as short as a couple of weeks, but we've also had people that we've, you know, been talking to for a year and a half and then they finally sign up. So it's, it's that traditional route. Got it. And, and when you say traditional, like what kind of, um, what kind of, style of marketing are you doing a lot through content are you doing a lot through social like how are you kind of prioritizing is it just a lot of outreach yep so it's a lot of outreach but then it's also supplemented with um with content on our own site pushing content refreshing content we're a big believer in refreshing content in any industry it helps so we might not be posting the newest content but we're always refreshing content that performs or is already indexed yeah. And then LinkedIn has just been on fire the last, you know, 14 months, um, you know, so LinkedIn has been great for us um, from, from a couple different perspectives of getting our, our brand out there, finding the right talent, finding new customers. And then, you know, last but not least, you know, I'm a big fan of direct response marketing. We launched the company through direct mail, so we still do a lot of direct mail. So tell me a little bit about that because that's, you know, very <laughs> counterintuitive to a lot of the conversations I'm having. Right. And, you know, look, I mean, I'm a firm believer and if something's working, let's go. But uh, tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about it, the strategy, because that's an interesting approach. Yeah. So the, the key factor is, is, you know, I'm a big believer of verticalization, right? We talked about that earlier. And the important factor in that is understanding your market. So understanding who your ideal client avatar is. In our case, it's companies, right? It's a B2B sale, it's a B2B transaction. They have offices, they have brick and mortar, you know, things like that. So um, we started out with direct mail. Our first client, obviously, we, we had a relationship with, but our second, third, fourth client it came 100% from direct mail. So cold outreach, you know, we did the research on the companies, we understood who they were, and then, you know, we, we went back to, you know, one of the old, um, you know, experts in the industry. We pulled some Gary Halbert stuff. We developed, uh, we developed a cool letter around some of his techniques and some of his mm-hmm. copywriting and, uh, we, we sent it out and we still, um, 
you know, five years later, I still send out a batch of those letters every uh, every quarter um, to to new prospects, and people remember me because of it. Um, so direct mail is not dead if you're right. in the right niche or the right market. So you know, sure. you could be in a different market where you know social makes a lot of sense. You know, social doesn't social makes sense for us just from LinkedIn. Facebook, you know, all of that stuff doesn't make sense. But, you know, if you really understand what your customer avatar is and how to reach them, you know, you understand your age segment, understand how you can get a hold of them, you know, everything can, can work, you know. And in our case, direct mail works tremendously. And at the time, well, actually, what I still love, when we did direct mail, people were like, wow, you're really disrupting. And it was kind of funny. It was like, oh, it's just because we're not spamming you with email people right. thought we were doing something different and you know direct mail has been around forever right and yeah. still even today people think like wow you're doing something something so so different and so radical it's really not it's direct mail <laughs> i mean it's been around <laughs> forever right yeah it's interesting have you thought at all about um you know opportunities for i mean obviously with hosting and with some stuff you'll have opportunity with you know recurring or even like lower ticket entry points for yourself. Have you thought a little bit about, I just, it just kind of came into my mind. Have you thought about, you know, going the info slash education route a little bit as like almost like a front end lead into maybe hiring you as a bigger picture thing? Yeah, we've, we've, we've done a few webinars. I think that's kind of where you're going. Um, and we, we just haven't had the time to expand those out, but yeah, we definitely are looking at doing some type of knowledge portal to educate yeah. people on that. Um, because like you were talking about, um, you know, before we started about different marketing and stuff, and it's, it's not just throwing out an e-commerce site, you need to market that site. So we definitely yeah. are, are looking to move into that more education realm so that our clients can grow, you know, on the platform because, you know, building an e-commerce site, you still got to get the traffic coming in, right? So how do you yeah. get that traffic coming in? And, you know, like I talked about earlier, our, our end clients, they need to understand who their customer avatar is so that they can then, you know, find the right media or medium to market to, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. One thing that I, that I was thinking, so the webinar thing can be, I, I don't mind it. I'm not a big webinar guy overall. Um, I find like when you, I get the feeling when you log on to it, you're like, you're just waiting because I know the sales pitch is coming. You're kind of like the whole time you're like, oh, okay, come on, just just tell me what it is. Um, but what about, uh, and, I, and I don't know if it could work for you, but one thing I'm thinking about for myself is um, like small online courses. Mm -hmm. So the way I, so with us, we train. So if a business wants to learn how to use Google ads, we'll sit them down with an expert on a video call. We'll build the campaign. We'll explain everything that's going on. They get a copy of the recording so they can kind of do it themselves later. But there's some people that say, well, I can't afford to maybe go and buy this whole package. So I'm thinking about, and, and I think it will work for me because it's a little bit more straightforward, but I'm almost thinking about like a, almost like a $600 online course of like how to actually take those steps yourself, base, base Shopify theme, tapping into your API, picking your products and almost having like an online course if someone couldn't afford maybe the whole thing, but it might be a nice entry point into you. I mean, it would take some infrastructure, but um, kind of a cool idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. We, 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 we grapple with that a lot. We'd love to have, you know, a, a solution like that. The challenge that we have in the automotive industry is the data. So as a retailer, um, you kind of almost have to be approved by a wholesale distributor, approved by a manufacturer, and that's where the data comes from. While we deal with a lot of manufacturers, those manufacturers still don't want their data just going to just anybody. So they're, everyone's an authorized dealer of the parts that they do. So the turnkey um, the model, we just haven't figured that out yet because, like I said, we respect what the manufacturers have done and we want to respect the channel because we work in all different aspects of the channel. So we haven't gotten that far, but we're, that's something that's definitely on our radar for this year and we're working on it. We're working closely with some manufacturers and a couple of wholesale distributors around that concept. Nice. Yeah, one other thing I was thinking, you know, it's even if they're not kind of ready for the online, but just to kind of move them into the ecosystem, you know, even doing some like video training content on, you know, how to use Canva, where, you know, your face is down in the corner and you're walking through how to make a, yep. a flyer or a poster um, yeah. could be a really good in. And then it's just a matter of where do they go? Do they go into, you know, an email, you know, into your email marketing piece or, or whatever the case, how do you, how do you do nurture right now or is it because it's b2b it's like you're only working with a finite number or you just kind of everyone's in a crm and there's just a basic follow-up or do you do email marketing now 
Nope, nope. We don't do email marketing, so every email that we send out is personal email um, so that it gets delivered and it has that personal touch. But we do use some automation. So we use close.io as our CRM. And okay. the reason that I chose close.io is that um, you can do all your phone calls through there. So they have a really cool system where it logs everything because, um, you know, I'm traditional, right? So I started out in direct mail. I do a lot of cold calling as well. So a lot of follow-ups on phone calls. So it's very easily logged all of our phone calls, you know, as we as we make those calls. And it's really awesome. And so within close.io, you know, it has autoresponder functionality. We've built out some campaigns. Um, we don't get crazy with it. Like I said, we want everything to be touch, um, you know, or when we touch that customer, we want it to be personal. We want it to be about their project. We don't want it to just be general. And that's, you know, one of the things that I think people respect about us. Once once they do contact us, we're not bombarding and we're always adding value. I mean, I think you hear it a lot in marketing or, or content. You got to add value. And that's what we're constantly trying to do. I'm not saying that email marketing is, is bad because it's not, but it's just not doing it in a mass scale you know, hitting the button with a message to all of our clients, even though we're specialized, just yeah. isn't us. So we focus on that, you know, one-on-one -on -one contact and, you know, um, and building out just kind of small sequential stuff. Love it. Um, so, I mean, obviously you've been involved in a lot of conversations um, with people in the auto industry, people that maybe want to expand their reach. They want to expand um, maybe selling online. What's, what's some of the big um, mistakes that you've seen in terms of like, people attempting to kind of dive into it or just from a business operation standpoint, if there's people kind of in that space listening, um, what, like what, what are the things that you've seen that are like a, you know, the common problem or the thing that's, you know, caused people <laughs> yeah. friction? Yeah, that's an easy one. And that's a big one in the industry. And it, it's, it's been around forever and it probably won't go away. But the, the biggest fallacy in the industry is the more SKUs you have online, the more products or the more you'll sell. So in other mm -hmm. words, the more products you have. And just like what, what Celicor believes in, you know, verticalization, the automotive industry, you know, is very much, um, you know, around that as well. So what I mean by that is if you have a website, don't try to be the be-all, end-all to everybody. So don't have replacement parts and everything. I mean, there are some sites out there that tout they have a million parts. They tout they have 10 million parts, whatever. Right. The guys that are being really successful are, you know, are guys that have honed in on niches. And by that means, you know, you're a Jeep guy, so you sell Jeep parts. You're a BMW guy, so you focus on, you know, four major or the five major um, German brands, so Euro parts. Um, you know, the younger crowd going after some of those Japanese cars in the Nissan market, um, things like that. So niching down are the guys that are being successful and then slowly kind of growing it out, not just going and, and um, you know, adding every part known to man on the site which we get calls about that all the time. Hey, I signed right. up for such and such wholesale distributor. They have 300,000 parts. I want to put them all for sale online. Right. Well, that confuses the cost, the client, right? You know, what yeah. do they do? Are they the best? You pick up the phone. You can't always be an expert in everything. So, you know, guy needs, you know, guy wants to answer, answer, ask a question about his part. You can't answer that. Boom. You lose a sale because yeah. you probably got a phone call about a part that you shouldn't even be dealing with in any ways. Got but it. just like our philosophy and how we started Celicor, um, we believe in that for our end clients too, and focusing on a niche or focusing on, you know, what segment of the market you do really well at. Got it. And when you say niche, I mean, you niche, you, you specified kind of the, the vehicle brand or the vehicle manufacturer. Have you seen it successfully done where it's like this part yeah. or all the different kinds? Like you can kind of niche in a multiple, in multiple. Yeah. Brands. Yeah. We have a very successful client and they make custom brake lines. And now they're, you know, so they basically do anything related to brake lines or anything related to fluid delivery within the car. So they might not manufacture the full brake turnkey brake kits. They do sell them. So you can actually, and it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. You can actually focus in on a certain segment of parts. We have another um, client that's very successful and he sells remanufactured engines. Hmm. So, you know, he basically an engine. He also sells remanufactured remanufactured transmissions and then he'll sell like the belts and all the other stuff that's complementary to it you know he can do it as one click upsells and things along those lines so you're right it's not necessarily focused on just on the manufacturer or the segment of the market it can be focused on the types of parts got it and um i'd love to pick your brain uh, as kind of our last 
uh, subject matter, you know, just kind of bring the focus back on to yourself. I mean, you've obviously been in this space for a while. You've obviously had a, a good amount of success. Um, when you're, you know, I think a lot of people, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of content out there about finding your niche and niching down. Do you have any advice to people when they're um, maybe trying to select it or um, how to like make sure you stay focused on it? Just some stuff that you've seen through your time that's helped you stay focused or grow it the right way. Do you have any thoughts or any advice on that? Yeah. So when you pick a market, you obviously got to make sure it's big enough, right? That can sustain your goals. I mean, you really need to understand, you know, your business plan needs to understand what your goals and your aspirations are. You know, do you want to be a million dollars? Do you want to be five? Do you want to be 10? You know, can the industry sustain it? And from there, it's doing the research. And it's literally, can be as simple as just, you know, pulling up that, you know, Dunn's number and doing some research on what lists you can pull of companies that are within there and just seeing if the numbers make sense. The second thing that I like to do a lot when you're entering into a market is look for trade shows and trade organizations and then look at the attendance numbers at those trade shows or the attendance or, or the membership numbers with those organizations. That is telling a lot. You know, if you can, you know, find a niche or an industry that has a need and they have a trade show, you can get instant credibility by becoming, you know, a member as well as attending the trade show as an exhibitor, ask for a speaking engagement, anything along those lines, and then kind of moving in there. For us, you know, you asked the question about keeping it going. For us, every time we turn around, there's a different niche within the, within the automotive segment that we like or there's new innovations coming out. So because of the new innovation, there's just all of these new things coming out. It seems like there's, it's just growing company-wise and there's more prospects for us left and right, and that's what keeps us excited. And then at the core of it, everyone that works for us is pretty much uh, into the cars or trucks. So, you know, we love what we do. So, you know, I'm a truck guy. My wife drives a Jeep. Another guy drives a, you know, a, a, a Volvo. Um, another guy drives a truck. So, you know, we're into it. We, we enjoy we enjoy the industry and that's what keeps us going. So if you heard the old adage, you know, find your passion, it's not really work. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of what we do because we work, we love technology and we love the industry. Love that. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, I think, you know, in this day and age, it feels like there's a lot of people that are almost fabricating their interest in a niche just because there's some <laughs> trend or there's some excitement around it. I don't know, do you follow Hustle Trends? No, no. No, so there's a daily marketing newsletter called The Hustle, and they have um, a paid newsletter, like a upsell kind of thing called Trends, where they, uh -huh. re they research, thing that ha research things that are like up and coming or there's been a spike in search for them. And uh, I actually had to stop reading the publications because like every time I would read one, I was like, oh, I got to buy this domain just in case I want to start a, <laughs> a weed agency or a this or like just crazy <laughs> stuff. And um you know, we can all, as entrepreneurs, we can easily get distracted by shiny yeah. things. So, you know, it's a unique, unique challenge, but it seems like you've got a good handle on it. It's definitely hard. You know, you, you think about it a lot because you're right. You're an entrepreneur. You think of, you see the opportunity, you want to jump right into it, you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, you only have so much time. And the more that you can focus on that one thing that's making you the most money, the more, the better off you're going to be. So before you branch out, you know, make sure you got that good foundation and, and don't move into too many direction in too many different directions. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Well, it was uh, some great, great wisdom to finish it off. Look, yeah. thanks so much for coming on. It was a pleasure speaking with you. How can people find you and uh, your businesses? Yeah, your great. Business? Thanks for asking. So our main company is called Celacore. That's C-E-L-L-A-C-O-R-E. -L -L -E. And so it's Celacore.com. We're located in Florida. So, um, you know, we're on the East Coast time zone. And then me personally, you can find me on LinkedIn or Instagram. And that's at Tony Minock for both of them. And it's T-O-N-Y-M-I-N-O-C-K. And my office phone number is 813-775-4109. Feel free to give me a call. I answer old the phone. School. I'm a real old, person. <laughs> old school. I love it. Giving, yeah. out the phone, giving out the phone number. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. Well, listen, man, thanks so much. Uh, it, was, it was really great. Really interesting, you know. Um, the automotive space, you know, just to me, when I hear about it and when I see it, it's like a black hole of big, you know, obviously the big industry with big numbers, um, yep. but it, but carving it down in that way, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily think about how it can kind of niche out and you, it's, it's a really interesting path that you guys have and uh, seems like it's primed for some great longevity. So. I agree. Thanks, man. We appreciate the support. Thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate it. It was good getting to chat with you.
All right, Tony, thanks.